available to you within uh, 24 hours at the Marin County Office of Education website, Rethinking Schools Component. Um, I wanted to just make note that uh, Dr. Willis and uh, Dr. Santora, that this represents the 16th time that they have been available to our community uh, to provide Im important information as we have been on the journey uh, related to COVID that goes all the way back to March 9th. So Dr. Willis in advance, thank you so much for uh, sort of traveling this road with us. It means more than you can even imagine. Um, today we're gonna cover several things. First, um, Dr. Willis will give us a general update. He'll provide us information related to the new California blueprint um, and the four tiers, um, talk a bit about the TK uh, through grade six waivers that have been granted. Some of those are actually pending. Um, talk about the public health guidance uh, that we've just recently received related to small cohorts and then about the school uh, site protection plan. Uh, several of you have already submitted questions, so thank you in advance for that. Um, and the chat will be open for those of you that might have questions during this session. And so I'm honored now to pass the um, screen and the mic to uh, Dr. Matt Willis, the public health officer from Marin County and the most outstanding in the state. So to you, Dr. Willis. Thank you, Mary Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. Um, Mary Jane has gone through the outline for today's conversation. Um, so I'll start with um, just reorienting us to kind of the overall framework of how we're approaching this um, in Marin County, really keying off of how the World Health Organization defines health um, as being a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. Um, and I think that's particularly apt for us as we tackle some of the most challenging dilemmas and balancing risks and benefits um, when we have the the disease of COVID-19 on one end of the spectrum, and then the social, mental, and physical uh, well-being on the other end, and trying to sort of balance how do we navigate this decision um, as the disease um, or as the epidemic progresses, the pandemic progresses in our community. Um, this is a particularly important time for us to be having this conversation because we are coming into a transitional period with regards to our experience of the pandemic, we're seeing significant improvements and I'll go into that um, more specifically. But we also have um, through the state and a new state framework that I'll introduce um, new permissions uh, that the state is now allowing us uh, in, in ways that we had not been allowed just by law um, up until very recently, um, which opens opportunities for us um, across, the, across society, including in our schools. So I'm going to get into that now. Um, this is our, our case rates over the month of uh, late, late July and into August. And basically the story here is, you know, we all recognize that I think July was a really difficult month for us in, in Marin, in the Bay Area, in the state of California. We saw dramatic increases in cases starting in late June. Um, we in Marin experienced the, the unfortunate uh, and tragic um, outbreak at San Quentin State Prison with about 2,500 cases. Um, we saw um, record numbers of deaths. We had 33 deaths in July in Marin compared to 19 in August. Um, our case rates in July were twice what they are right now. Um, so August was a, was a better month for us. And um, this, is the, this graph shows the, the number of cases that we have per 14 day period per 100,000 residents. This is the way the state was measuring our, our incidents. And that, that green uh, bar there, that dotted line shows the, the incidence of 100 per 100,000 residents per two weeks, which was the cutoff for us being categorized as being on the state monitoring list. We are among the, that majority of, of counties that were on that monitoring list. That framework has changed in ways that I'll explain, but you can see that we're right on the edge of actually t t in t moving into off of the monitoring list. Um, importantly, um, our testing rates um, have not changed significantly over the past three weeks. So when we see decreases in case rates, we know that it's not just because we're testing less. And then also importantly, we also see a decrease in our percent positivity. So when you see that combination of testing the same amount, 
fewer cases with a decrease in percent positives among those tests that we have, that is a, is a reassuring um, assembly of, of data for us to, to, to see that we're probably seeing significant reductions in virus transmission in our county. And then we're also seeing um, uh, our hospitals. This is, the, this is the chart that shows the percent of beds in, in our hospitals in Marin County that are occupied by patients suffering from COVID-19. Um, and that remains below 10%. So now I'm going to just explain the, the new framework that was introduced by, by the governor um, on Friday, on Friday afternoon. Not an unfamiliar dynamic for us locally to be um, adapting early in the week to announcements that were made at the end of the week by the state. Um, but I think this is, this is a positive step. Um, it's a more nuanced framework um, for the state and one that we uh, welcome and will, uh, will follow in Marin. The state has now categorized all counties um, into one of four tiers according to the burden of disease of COVID-19 in that county. Um, previously, it had been one of two tiers, where you're either on the monitoring list or you're not on the monitoring list. Um, so this is a more nuanced approach. Um, what this shows is the purple tier, it's also color coded in the, in the same colors that we use for the, for the air quality. Um, there is no green tier, you'll notice, and that because, that's because there's no, there's no suggestion that you know, we're out of the woods. There, there, as long as there's no vaccine and as long as the, the epidemic or, or the virus is still part of our community, we're not considering any of the categories to be safe in that, in that sort of what would be suggested by green. So um, we are now one of those 58 counties that are in, one of 38 counties that are in the purple or tier one. Um, we are slated uh, because of what I showed you in that graph where we're close to being in that next tier. We are slated to move into tier two um, next Monday, um, as long as we don't have any significant changes. I don't an anticipate um, any changes to our numbers that would suggest that we can't move forward into tier two. Um, and that would be in moving from the widespread risk category, which is purple, into the substantial risk category, which is orange. There are four tiers, as I mentioned, um, in this new categorization scheme, um, widespread, substantial, moderate, and minimal, color-coded, the, the, and it's based on two primary metrics. One is the number of cases, um, and instead of using two-week case rates, the new metric is going to be daily case rates. It's gonna be the same number, it's just sort of more intuitive and easier to think of it as a daily number. So that daily number for us, if we have less than seven cases per day per 100,000 residents, which is about 18 cases total in Marin County per day on average, we move from that widespread into substantial. And then positivity, percent positivity. Any county that has more than 8% positive tests um, will be in that widespread um, transmission highest risk tier. Uh, our, our percent positivity and, and uh, case rates uh, land us right now in the next tier down. This is a blow up of Marin County. Um, and if you, anyone goes on to the a website, which I'll share shortly, you can, you can prove this and see uh, this information that I'm sharing with you and other information. So what, what this shows is that Marin County, as of 831, we are in that tier one, um, but we are slated to move into tier two. If you look on the box there, that's the blow up of Marin, it says new COVID-19 cases per day per 100,000 is 5.9, um, so less than that seven. And then it says adjusted case rate for tier assignment is 4.6. That's a factor that they've added um, as part of this new framework, which gives credit to counties for high testing rates. Marin County has among the highest testing rates in the, in the state. Um, and they recognize that the more we test, the more cases we find. One of our primary organizers of our strategy has been to really make sure that we're ascertaining cases as early as possible, when and where they're happening so we can intervene. So we've done a lot of testing and we're testing in the right places, so we're seeing more cases. Um, and, uh, and the state sort of offers an adjustment factor. So we get our total case rates get down adjusted insofar as how it applies to what tier we fall into. So there are measured tier assignments, actually 4.6 cases per day per 100,000, which is well below that cutoff of seven. Our percent positivity rate in, in Marin County is 3%. Again, well below that cutoff of 8%. And these are why it's reassuring that we, we should be moving into that next tier next Monday. So these are the key features of the new blueprint. Um, it is a mandatory, they're manda it's, you know, it's statewide. So there are mandatory metrics for all counties, case rates and test positivity, simple, 
measurable. Um, there are four categories instead of 58 counties with different sets of rules. Um, counties are functioning under statewide orders that allow where, which tiers we can move into at different times, which I'll share with you. It's a, it's a slower framework. We need to spend at least 21 days in any tier before advancing to the next, except at the start, you know, because we're starting here for one week in, in purple and then we'd move into, into red. But after that, before we'd move into any other category, we'd have to have at least uh, three weeks in tier red, for example, before we could move into tier orange, even if our numbers continue to improve significantly. It's also incremental. So sectors progressively open more operations in each tier, rather than just being open or closed, um, they can move progressively. For example, restaurants can open at 25% uh, when we're in uh, indoors, when we're in tier two. And then if we can move into tier three, they could open 50%. And then in tier four, you can open even more. Um, so it's a, it's a progressive and more elastic scheme. Um, and then it's also responsive, um, that we can tighten back up when conditions worsen. So if, if, any, if we have two weeks straight where our numbers correspond to the more restrictive tier, we move into that more restrictive tier um, automatically. And then we would have three days to adapt our operations to match the restrictions for that tier. Here's another, um, Another feature of this, which will be forthcoming in October, but I wanted to flag it for us, um, is that there will be a, an equity metric added to that. So not just the, the percent positivity in the case rates, but there'll be a third and it's an equity metric. And it, it relates to a minimum proportion of tests that must be performed in low income communities. Um, and that's it's one way to make sure that the counties are strategic and making sure that they're really testing in those areas that are at highest risk. Also make sure that people aren't gaming the system by only testing um, people who are much less likely to be infected. Um, but also, um, you know, we, it, any county that doesn't meet that criteria where they're not um, testing a significant proportion of their tests being allocated to lower income, higher risk communities will not advance, even if they meet other criteria. Um, and reassuringly, our current st testing strategy does meet that criteria because we've been testing in our lower income communities as well. So these are um, some of the anticipated reopenings and I'll get to schools shortly. Um, uh, August 31st, um, we started in tier one. As I said, the reopenings permitted for everywhere across the state um, included hair salons, barber shops, indoors. So that was a step that was taken in Marin on Monday, um, as well as indoor shopping centers. Um, so I think our one indoor shopping center, Northgate Mall was able to open on Monday as well. And then libraries can open at 25% capacity reflecting what I said about that, that incremental and tiered approach. Anticipated for next week, September 8th, tier two, we would be able to open indoor restaurants at 25% capacity or 100 people, whichever is fewer. Um, bars remain closed um, across the state, uh, regardless of tier. Um, indoor shopping centers would be able to open to 50% capacity. Um, personal services, so outside of the hair salons, you could uh, other uh, nail salons, estheticians, facials, et cetera, can open indoors. Um, museums, uh, zoos and aquariums, I think we only have museums of those categories, uh, can open it at, at indoor capacity of 25%. Um, worship services indoors, also 25%. Movie theaters, also at 25%. Um, and gyms and fitness centers can open at 10% capacity. And when we talk about capacity here, it's based on the fire codes that in every, in every setting, in every room, in every building, there's a, a description of the, of the maximum capacity of people that is safe to be gathered there. And that's the number we key off of when we talk about these percents. And then um, in tier two, libraries could open at 50% capacity. Obviously, there's you know, a lot of different sectors that I did not mention. Um, and uh, one nice feature of the new blueprint is there's an easy queryable function where you can go online at covid19.ca.gov. Um, the, the numbers for every county are represented there. They are updated weekly on Tuesdays. That's how our, our, any, any changes in our tier would be signaled uh, on this website. And obviously if we're getting signals that our numbers are changing, we'll communicate with our community directly to anticipate and plan for any changes. Um, but you can also go and if you, if you pull down, type in Marin or pull down Marin on the pull down and then type in any activity or pull it down on the, on the menu, uh, you can see which, where we are with regards to that particular sector at any given time on this, on this new website. 
So um, let me get into the um, waiver application process uh, now, because obviously um, one of the, I should mention, you know, one of the key features of this, of the new, um, of the sectors, um, and I've sort of separated off schools for, from this, which is um, any school uh, in the state of California for counties that are in, in tier two or any less restrictive tier may open to classroom-based instruction without a waiver from the local health officer, um, according to and following the California Department of Public Health and the California Department of Education guidance. Um, and so for Marin, um, we would have to, and, 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 and for those counties that would open schools, um, it, it's, it can only happen, it would happen at the earliest two weeks after that county enters the new, that, that tier. So for us, if we enter into tier two on, on, on September 2nd, on September 22nd, we would be able to, any school, TK through six, as well as secondary, as well as higher education, would be able to open under California law to classroom-based instruction. We're also in this interval now, because we are in tier one, where we, have, we can only open to classroom-based instruction based on a waiver application process. Um, and so I'll update you on where we are with that. So we're in, a, we're in an interval now where in order to open before September 22nd, there would need to be a waiver. And after, 20, after September 22nd, there would not need to be that waiver. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So here, here's where we are with the waivers. We've gotten 27 waiver applications um, to, received by Marin County Public Health. 15 have been approved by us locally and submitted to California Department of Public Health. California Department of Public Health has reviewed them and has offered 13 approvals for site-based classroom instruction starting September 8th. Um, we're waiting for the approval on those final two um, that were submitted last week. And now we have 12 additional applications in process this week, which will be submitted to CDPH on Friday. Um, if those are approved locally and by CDPH, the schools, that the, those 12 schools or those that are approved can open the following week on September 14th. If you want to look at the, the list of schools submitting waivers, you can look at the MCOE website. Um, and waivers should be submitted to, Mer, uh, to publichealthwaiver at marinschools.org. So that's where we are with the waiver application process. And I tend to advance, sorry. Something got stuck. My computer is thinking about, apparently it's, it's thinking about letting me advance the slides. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it over shortly to Dr. Lisa Centaur, who I see is on the line, to, um, to talk about the cohorts um, in, in schools. And I think what I'll do is stop, maybe stop, it looks like it's hung up, stop sharing and then restart Start sharing again. I know there'll be questions and we'll have plenty of time for questions. All right, I stopped sharing. I'm going to reshare my screen now. And hopefully I'll be able to, you'll be able to see this. Hi, Lisa. I see Lisa. Yeah, it's, uh, it's frozen. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. Give, me one more, give me one more second. Okay, there we go. You see that? I'd still, I'm just stuck on that slide. That's the issue. Well, do you want to, um, Lisa? Are you able to verbally summarize where we with the where we are with the cohort size? Sure, I can just um, reference everyone. Um, we are in an interesting place together because there's different guidance that's being offered by the state for schools, um, childcare, and our small groups. So, if you can imagine. The reason why the state issued new guidance around um, small groups, small group cohorts is because they recognize that because of school closures, there was a phenomenon that we've all seen an experience of the creation of both informal and formal learning hubs. And there was a fear that because with the lack of any information and the lack of any guidance that we had the potential to create um, or not, uh, not ensure that there was safer space created for these learning hubs, which is why the state offered this additional guidance that we have crosswalked 
we walk through with the child care, other child care programs that exist in our community, some of the privates and um, city based child care programs that are out there and a whole bunch of other activities that um, build the kind of the social network of Marin County to walk through that guidance. The guidance is available on on the web and I can I can actually share share my screen. Um, I'll stop I'll stop Matt's screen sharing if I can find this screen that I want to share. Maybe we're we're both um, screen sharing illiterate today. <laughs> okay, it doesn't want to share my screen either. So I'll give one more effort to find the screen that I want to share. Nope. Not wanting me to share either. So we'll skip ahead. So we'll um, share the link. So there's been a lot of confusion about it because of first the size. We led with the size of 15 um, when we originally provided guidance for child care. There we go. Um, child care um, and youth, youth activities during the summer. And that was where we were in July with um, increasing rates and wanting to provide the guidance um, for that. We, the state has now shifted and has a cohort the size of 14. And the challenge with that is that there have been, we appreciate there's been businesses that have enrolled 15 and now are reconciling their enrollment patterns to the 14, but we are staying consistent with the state this one of the, the benefits of having this new structure from the state is that it's allowing us to align with the state framework and we, that is and to de decrease some of the confusion and having 58 counties with 58 different guidance. Now we can have a standardized approach. So Marin County is fully adopting this um, for these small cohorts. Um, again, this is different than the guidance that's offered for schools, but for these um, small cohorts to um, operate with 14 students and two staff. The second um, question that has come up frequently is the two staff. We recognize that many of the child care facilities um, and child care programs are operating with more than two staff. This does allow there to be exceptions, especially for with it, for substitutes or other um, break times, et cetera, to allow that. But the goal really around this is we really are trying to create very stable cohorts in, in these small group environments. The other thing that comes up is that, and I, I've described this multiple times, is that even in regular childcare, as virtual learning is, is going on, um, no longer is special education the only space where there might need, need to be one-on-one -on -one specialized services. So as we have younger children, K and first grade, who are in a childcare environment and need access to one-on-one -on -one supports for um, virtual learning, which is not natural for might be more natural for our third and fourth graders, but certainly not the, the, the natural learning environment for a kinder and first grade that they may need one-on-one one -on -one attendance. And so this guidance that's offered by the state does allow for additional support service providers um, to provide, to be added to the cohort, to provide that one-on-one -on -one specialized assistance that is needed. Um, so there's, it does not exclude any specific group in this, but they did list occupational therapy and other supports um, that are, are needed for students. But we're seeing in the outside environment, sometimes it's just having an attendant who can help younger children and accessing while the cohort is maintained. So a lot of this is really is just common sense back to the basics that we are trying to create stable cohorts. And again, this does not override any of the guidance that is coming out from our office for the uh, reopening of schools or the um, office of um, from the state regarding school school reopenings and that's one of our challenges is just trying to crosswalk that for you. So if you go to our website marinrecovers.org there are frequently asked questions that will be updated probably today after the presentation that we had yesterday and we'll see if there's any missing um, need additional clarifications that we need to provide in order for um, for everyone to understand this this process as well. And that's it. Lisa, can, thank you. Um, can you also um, just summarize for us the uh, school site specific protection plan and, and the review process that we anticipate after the waiver process is ended? Yes, yeah, so we are going to be requiring that we review all of the um, site based, um, the school site safety protection plans. This is really to be in part to ensure that we have a strong partnership with the schools and that we are providing 
enough technical assistance and consultation prior to the reopening of, of schools. So it's not an approval process like it was for the waivers, but it's a re review process. And again, that's really just to um, cement our partnership with you as we move together with reopening schools and making sure that you've had the lens of a public health nurse and the public health nurse, if there's any questions or concerns, can um, channel the questions up to Dr. Willis or myself so we can make sure that your site-specific protection plan um, is meeting our guidance and requirements and that we're not identifying any opportunities or for improvement or any, any gaps that exist there. And I think this is, again, this is one of this, I believe this is the core, the protection plan in place is our first barrier to the entry of um, preventing COVID-19 from entering our schools. And so this is what is creating a safer environment. It's promoting uh, a, both the classroom environment and the school environment where children are wearing face covers as appropriate, as well as staff that we're maintaining, the, the, the distancing and optimizing disinfection and cleaning all of the things that are going to reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission in our schools. Thank you, Dr. Santora. Um, I just want to, we'll, we'll open it up to questions in a second. I just want to um, remember that we're coming into to Labor Day weekend um, and we're coming off of a, of a month of um, improvement. And the last thing we want to do is jeopardize that improvement um, with, with celebrations. Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly too early to celebrate um, you know, success regarding COVID-19. I think we're still obviously quite vulnerable to um, reversing the gains that we've achieved. Um, and especially so if, um, if we feel too relaxed um, and if we come into this long weekend where um, gatherings, especially indoor gatherings, um, could fuel transmission. We saw that uh, 4th of July, uh, the measurable increases after 4th of July and Memorial Day um, and uh, really the last thing we need right now is, is another um, surge of transmission coming into the month of September. Um, our priority, uh, really socially, our priority is to get kids back into school. Um, and uh, the best way we can do that is to be at our best um, and, uh, and practicing physical distancing, especially now we're, you know, with, the, with the wildfire smoke that we might be experiencing in Marin County coming into this weekend. Um, you know, one concern I have is that gatherings that had otherwise been scheduled to be occurring outdoors with people outside of your household, um, that people might say, well, we'll just move it inside. That's certainly not a safe strategy uh, this time. So canceling, postponing them, you know, rain check on those gatherings is probably a much safer strategy. And I can just add, I'm often on the front line of some of the phone calls of businesses and schools when they have a first known exposed staff or COVID positive staff. And generally it, the, the, the phrase that precedes the notice is that, well, the staff went to a wedding or the staff went to a party. So where we see in the transmission in some of our lower income communities in crowded, due to crowded housing situations that are not uh, preventable due to, due to low income and low wages, what is preventable is our gatherings. And that is the, the common narrative in, of many of the phone calls is that um, these the voluntary engagements outside of our bubble and outside of our, our households. And again, this is all of us in it together and really thinking small. And we'll be again, targeting our out outreach towards parents who play a critical role in also thinking small and limiting their engagement. So we can make sure that when kids come on school, they the risk of their exposure to COVID-19 always remains extremely low because of our, our protective behaviors. So Lisa, as a question on that point, um, what do you think should be the accountability for people that don't follow uh, safe practices um, during times when they're not at work? I think the key is for us to see something and say, say something to them. We, we have to role model the behaviors ourselves and that can be really challenging because all of us are fatigued. I think trying to get um, school back on board and getting our community back on board, but we have to role model our, ourselves when we hear of other colleagues or families that are making decisions to say something to them. Because again, we've made tremendous gains. Um, I did not expect us to move as quickly down um, as we've seen us move. And I think what we saw is Marin County saw what happened after 4th of July and really did pull back on their uh, gatherings and, and did respond appropriately and engaged in more protective behaviors. But we always have our natural regression. So I think 
talking to your colleagues, encouraging your colleagues, talking to parents, and um, we'll be, again, releasing a parent handbook that really encourages people to think small and to, to limit their social activities and to limit their travel, because that's when we're exposing individuals. And when we start mixing households, that's when, that's the natural thing that have people miss engaging, um, but really just to think small as we reopen schools. So there's a quite a couple of questions here about the fact that we have staff, um, community members that live outside of the county and yet come into the county to work. Are there any special restrictions related to those uh, staff members? No, there are no there are no special restrictions related to people who live outside of the outside of Marin County. Okay. And to add to that, part of our surveillance plan is it's regardless of where you live, if, if you're staff, we have a testing strategy that's required as part of our guidance. And so when we have a lot of our reports, some of our challenges on this side is removing the non-Marin County residents um, from our data because, because of the cost of living in Marin County, we have a, a high number of residents who are traveling from other counties to Marin County to work. And so that's a reality and that's why we'll be working together with you to make sure we have testing on available for staff regardless of where where they live and that's where you're we're also going to be see, seeing changes in our testing landscape where health plans have to provide testing for individuals who are working in the school environment it's required and dr willis will be releasing um he can speak more to a, a public health order around testing and new advisory around testing to make sure that testing is available to everyone who um, lives and works in marin county great um I think this will go to you, Matt. As we enter tier two, can we open schools in person? Assuming it all works on 922, are there any limits to the cohort size? So we had been, you know, we started down this path in, in June. Um, I think we were, you know, in, in mid-June, we were um, optimistic that we were going to um, be able to open schools sooner than we ended up being able to open them. Um, you know, just it's really just after we released our our 30 point guidance that we started seeing increases in cases um, and, and and had to actually step back away from that. Um, now, so so the, that guidance remains in place um, and it's and it's time to apply that again. Uh, and the guidance actually hasn't changed. It, it was the right thing then. It's the right thing now. Um, so um, that that's it's on the website. Um, those are that's the school site specific protection plan that at least some as Dr. Santor mentioned in terms of what every every school that would seek to reopen would need to complete and and have a review from public health. Um, and the cohort size is defined in that document as being the the size that corresponds to um, the normal classroom size for that that age. Great. Um, what about, let me just keep going. Um, can you restate the timelines for moving into tier two? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try, it's confusing. Okay. Yeah, so, so uh, September 8th, um, we are scheduled to move into tier two, the red tier. Um, those sectors that I mentioned would be able to be, to, to outside of schools, all those other activities could, could open that day. Um, there's a special provision of an additional delay for opening schools of at least two weeks. So we would need to be in that red category for at least two weeks before schools could open. Um, so that would bring us to, what is that? The 22nd of September, I believe, um, that Tuesday um, of that week. Does that answer the question? I think so. Yeah, I, I would say yes. Um, the, there's a couple of questions here from, I think, probably the same anonymous attendee, and I'm going to try to group them because there's about four of them, um, but they relate to um, cohorts and staff members moving between cohorts. Um, so the example would be a specialist, uh, this example are PE arts music, but picture a speech therapist, an OT. Um, so that would be a question, how many cohorts can a staff member work with at a time? Yeah, and Dr. Santoro may have thoughts on this. You know, we, we haven't um, specified a specific number of, of cohorts. Um, you know, a lot of this ultimately comes down to everyone understanding and applying the principles that we all now hopefully understand in terms of transmission, physical distancing, covering our face, um, all the precautions that are outlined very clearly in the school site specific protection plan. 
Um, our goal would be that there would be as, 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 as practicable and as feasible as few cohorts as uh, an adult might be able to engage with. Um, if you're having to inter, you know, if there's only one speech therapist and there's a bulk, you know, multiple cohorts, opportunities to limit that might be optimizing virtual experiences or um, making sure that there's, a, you, know, the, the, you know, distance, physical distance is really well applied for each or trying to actually get more staff involved in that, in that activity so that you can actually diversify that work across um, a wider number of, of classrooms. Lisa, anything to add to that? No, I think again, just to reiterate, there's so much we have control over with our personal protective behaviors and that's again, our first barrier. And so that's why it is allowable for a person to um, be in one cohort or to another cohort. Again, we're trying our best to reduce those cohorts and um, just on the other side, just making sure that you have very good attendance and documentation of where those individuals and what classrooms they have, because as we've mentioned before, we're gonna be airing above above uh, caution when we um, close cohorts. So we'll wanna make sure we know where there may have been contacts there. And again, that's, we're not gonna be following, at least in the beginning, the definition of close contact in the school environment. If we do identify a case within a cohort, a cohort will be closed for that. Um, though for the person that may be from floating cohort, they may or may not, depending on our interview, we do a case, we'll do a case and investigation to determine if they also need to be excluded um, based on potential exposure. So it's that just reiterating the critical importance of documentation as we enter school and maintaining attendance records because that's, that's our tool with contact tracing. So this is when I'll take the question. Assuming schools can open for in-person instruction on September 22nd, the parents want the school to reopen, but the teachers of that school don't want to return in person. What recourse do parents have to move forward with reopening? So I would want you all to know as a community that our school district leaders, teachers, classified staff are working really hard uh, to be sure that everything is in place to ensure that staff and students are uh, going to be safe and that is the appropriate PPE along with a strong and will be reviewed school site specific plan. So I want you to know that we have the same goal and that will be that we get students back into school as safely as possible. And I wanna assure you that um, our schools have been working hard in that area. Um, we have many schools um, that are talking about how it is that they will be uh, moving forward with the, way, the TK6 waivers, looking at the possibilities of opening small cohorts now um, in order to begin to get students back into, into school. And many, many of our schools have already had students come into their schools, right? Visit their teacher, see where their desk is gonna be, start to learn the protocols about wearing a face covering and you know what the rules will be. So I think you would be pleased to know that there's been a lot of work that has happened um, even since the start of school. And for some of our schools, it was August 19th, others I think, 24th. We have one more school district that will be opening in person on September 8th, Sausley, the Run City, but do know that there's a, a commitment towards this and I feel like uh, our community is moving uh, toward getting students and staff back into school as soon as possible. Um, how quickly can schools be closed? Hey, Mary Jane, can I just, just yes. to that previous question, just because uh, the, you know, the health the health office position on that is sometimes there, there, there's, a, there's a sense that we may be um, being too permissive um, or too restrictive. Um, and just wanna be clear that our, our perspective is that we're trying to um, remove any barriers um, to children returning to the classroom. And that um, it is not a, you know, while we have the statutory authority to close schools, we do not have a corresponding uh, authority to open schools. Uh, there, it is up to the school community to open. What we can do is, again, remove barriers, offer as much guidance as we can for how that could be done as safely as it possibly can. That's been the work that we've been doing for the past few months. Uh, as, as Mary Jane said, we've had 16 conversations so far together. Um, and we've had, you know, the school site specific protection plan um, is very much in line with state guidance um, and, and, and Office of Education guidance. Um, and we will remain available to try and help navigate those questions as they come up um, for school districts and schools. Uh, how quickly can a school be closed after opening? And what is the guidance when a school has an outbreak? How do you define an outbreak? 
there are there are specific um, criteria in the state guidance for closures of schools, um, and it's um, it's actually relatively you know complex algorithm that has to do with the um, the number of the number of cohorts that have had to have been closed over a certain period of time, or the the per, the percent of the total students in a given school environment who have had to be excluded from school based on either infection or having been a close contact and needed to be quarantined. Um, and then the frequency that that might be occurring. All those are taken into account um, to determine whether or not a school needs to be closed. Um, the, the reason that there's that, that criteria outlined is to try and prevent rapid cycle closing and opening, kind of recognizing that that's extremely disruptive um, to both that educational experience and to the, and to the environment of, for both staff and parents. Right. Um, if a, so this is, a, if a kindergarten class has only 13 students, can it open without a waiver as a small cohort and an approved, uh, reviewed school site specific plan? So kindergarten would be a school, so it's right. not a childcare environment. So if they were opening right now, it would be under a waiver if they're providing in-classroom instruction. And on um, September 22nd, assuming that we are have moved from purple to red, um, then obviously with a, a reviewed school site specific plan, the answer to this would be yes. Yes, they can open on the 22nd um, once we review their school site specific protection plan. And again, our expectation is um, just as everyone should have already been vaccinated at the start of school, because vaccinations, school started in August, we're in September now. So just as every, all parents should have had their children's vaccines up to date, that virtual learning did not, should not have delayed that. Um, school started on September, on, in August. So our hope is that all schools have already um, completed, if they haven't completed, are very close to completing um, their school site um, specific protection plan. This is part of our new responsibility and it should have, it, it, homework was already due. Okay. Um, <laughs> Lisa, Lisa. Can we, so one more, one more point on that. If, if, a, if a school has, has um, already has, has applied for a waiver, um, you don't need to reapply, you don't need to fill out a school site, for another protection plan. That'll hold through. Mm -hmm. Lisa or Matt, can you talk a little more about special ed in particular? Um, so the question that's coming up has to do with the fact there, there are students that we serve um, in our special education programs between the ages of an infant all the way to age 22, um, some who have significant developmental delays and are functioning not at their age level, right? The question specifically is, in these um, cases, we have students that um, will not uh, wear a facial covering or have not yet been, you know, been able to uh, tolerate a facial covering. Um, there is not uh, the ability to maintain social distancing. Um, and uh, there are some that think that these students should not be allowed to attend school. So can you talk a little bit about that? You wanna start with that, Lisa? Sure. We wanna ensure access to all children and adolescents to school. And that is part of the American Disabilities Act, um, Act that we need to ensure access for all individuals with, um, with access and functional needs and in every part of our community and most especially in, in the educational environment. And that's something we've remained committed to since the beginning. We, again, a lot of the measures we have in place are more strict than they were in the beginning. And I feel confident with what we've seen in the childcare environment, I'm having over 7,000 days and only one one case-to-case -case transmission. And this is without children wearing face coverings. So it was a, it was a different time for us. Um, children weren't wearing face covering, required to wear face coverings then, that we can create the safer environments for children who um, are in our special education classes um, where they will have to have behavioral behavioral support. Some may need, not all, but some may need behavioral supports to help with face covering and may need more attendance in the classroom and that we can do that safely. And that I think the priority is ensuring access to all, regardless again of their access and functional needs. And we need to create these inclusive environments. Again, there's a lot of control of, of staff who are working in these environments um, in order to engage in those protective behaviors to protect themselves by wearing face coverings, by washing their hands more frequently um, in these spaces. And we have not 
in our special education um, cohorts, we have not had transmission of um, COVID-19. Um, and I do appreciate it. It can be a more challenging environment and we want to be able to provide the supports, but we need to ensure inclusivity for all children as we reopen schools. And it, I'll just to add, thank you. And I'll just add that, you know, if we, if we look at the, the state approach and, and, and the governor um, talking about reopening schools, it's one of the clear organizers around this is really prioritizing access for those that are most harmed um, in the absence of in-person learning opportunities. Um, and, and if you can imagine the distance learning um, alternatives um, and for the alternatives for parents to have to be you know, remaining at home for, for children uh, with special needs in that way, I think has been um, really one of the harshest lessons of the failure of, of sort of a, a, a distance learning paradigm. Um, and so that's been the, the first area that the state really offered special permission around, including up to allowing one-on-one -on -one, um, adult to child parent, you know, so if you, if, you, if you extrapolate that out, it really would mean that it's, it's legal um, in the current law that you could have 14 adults and 14 children in a single cohort um, if, they, if each of those children needed a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that's, as, that's how far the state is going towards um, trying to enable um, children of special needs and adolescents of special needs to have classroom-based learning. Um, can I just confirm that uh, the guidance about school site protective plans applies to private, public, independent, and parochial schools, not just public? Yes, it's all, all schools. All schools, right. The virus, the virus doesn't care. Right, 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 right. Um, do you have any guidance um, regarding back to school after families or students have traveled out of state? No, um, they're, they're, we, the CDC has ended its um, rec recommended quarantine from international travel. We in California can't travel to some states because we actually have a higher incidence. So you can't travel to New Jersey or New York with that, in Connecticut, I think, um, without going on quarantine yourselves. But again, I think this is where we first take that step back. Um, we should not be traveling. We really should be limiting those activities and, and thinking small, really encourage parents to reconsider the normal travel behaviors that we used to have, because this is where we're working together to keep our schools open. And so really being thoughtful about those travel behaviors in the first place for all of us, which is, um, I'm a traveler, so it's not my not what I prefer to do, but that's where we are to keep our schools open together. And then we monitor for symptoms that we've shifted. It's not going to be um, screening children with temperatures upon entry um, to school. So parents really need to be aware of their own activities, knowing if they have had any potential COVID-19 exposure, which generally in many cases would be because of some of their own voluntary activities and behaviors um, to monitor for symptoms um, because COVID is still circulating. Um, we can do our best, but it is um, still circulating in our community and to monitor for symptoms and then um, not sending kids to school get sick. Um, I know parents have since send school kids to school sick um, years past and um, we'll give Motrin and Tylenol and send them off to schools. This is where we again, we will be working with parents and educating them, but we cannot send kids to school sick. And that's um, so there's no special quarantines upon return to Marin County though, um, but to really just to monitor for your um, symptoms and to um, again, really limit that activity that could potentially expose you to other households where you don't know. Um, you don't know how other households behaving uh, are behaving. So um, really be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple questions again about, so if schools opens on the 26th, that means all schools can open regardless of grade level. The answer is yes. Yeah. Someone's not clear yet what the class size is when schools reopen on the 22nd. Um, and if you go to specific, the site specifics plan, it specifically de this, um, uh, defines that at the elementary level, for example, it would be whatever your typical class size is, i.e. if your kindergarten class is 25, that would be uh, what the number would be. Dr. Willis, would you mind sharing um, with people the concept of a larger cohort, i.e. the typical class size, versus students in multiple cohorts throughout a day, and why you think that's a stronger position from a public health standpoint. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, the goal of, um, of cohorts is to reduce mixing. Um, uh, it reduces, you know, probabilistically that you're going to encounter someone else who's been exposed, and then if we do have 
a case, it limits the number of others that have been exposed for our contact investigation. So we know exactly who might have been exposed and we can shut that down, get people quarantined, get people tested, um, and get people back into, back into school as quickly as possible. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns is that, um, if, um, if I'm hearing your question, um, Mary Jane, it's that if, if we, you know, a cohort of 25 that's a truly stable cohort is a lot better than, um, you know, multiple cohorts of 12 mixed out, th you know, throughout the day. And also we need to recognize that these cohorts are not just what's happening in the, in, in the classroom, but um, if you're, you know, if you're after school, allowing your children to um, mix with other kids or they're, they're having sort of more informal networking um, where it's, le it's less easy to track who they're with or what they're, what they're over the course of the week with a greater number of other kids um, where they're having close contact. We know they don't do well with social distancing. Um, that's, that's going to, I think, um, be actually a greater threat than, than the, the number per se within that cohort, as long as that cohort is a stable one. Okay, let me go back to um, a question that's come up quite a bit. Why did, why did public, so this is to the two of you, why did we loosen restrictions for returning to school after being ill? The issue is fever free without medication went from 72 hours when we were operating the pilots to 24 hours. Science. Science. <laughs> Science. Well, yeah, I mean, so we've, you know, we've learned that uh, if someone, obviously we want, we want to be as, as least restrictive as we can be as a principal. Um, and, and the science, you know, has, over time now, we have six months under our belt plus of, of global experience with, with, with COVID-19 and we're learning a lot about it. When someone defervesces for at least 24 hours, it's really unlikely that they're um, infectious or they would, they would have a recrudescence or a, a reemergence of the, of the disease where they become infectious again. So that, that 24 hour interval is a reliable indicator of, uh, of recovery. Um, and uh, the, the yield on waiting another 48 hours um, is, is, is negligible. And that's also for a, a case, that for a, COVID, a confirmed COVID case, they've also have been isolated for 10 days from the point of their positive test. And that actually is, again, already starts on airing on the side of caution because many people um, the point of their start of their illness is not um, day one from when they actually got tested. So we're already adding days at the end um, because people often are, have a delay before went from the start of illness to testing itself. And the 10 day period, which is what, what we're working with now, which again is very different than flu and the other diseases that we see is again, we're trying to capture the 99% possibility that these, there's even any virus that's um, able to be transmitted. Um, whereas in reality, it's usually um, day, day five after you've been, um, you start your illness with uh, COVID-19 is when you're, you're most infectious and then it decreases down as the amount, literally the amount of virus in your body is, is decreasing. Um, so again, we're, this was a novel. When we say novel, it's new and it's unknown to us, which is why we start with you know, very large timeframes as we're trying to learn more um, through evidence and research um, from the molecular level all the way to how it's behaving in different populations. And then we'll continue to see refining of that. And I think that's something for everyone to be prepared for is there'll continue to be updates from Centers for Disease Control, which will, um, will be affirmed or not by California Department of Public Health and your public health department in order to make sure that we stay up to date with, with science. And um, coronavirus is unique in that it, it mutates, it changes. And so that's why we are always um, following its behavior and learning how it's acting in our, in our community and we'll adjust to that. The changes are constant. Uh, just a couple more questions. I know we've hit our time. Uh, if you can talk a little bit more about testing, there's a few questions or more than a few here. Number one, why aren't we requiring staff to be tested uh, prior to re-entering school? Question number one. Question number two, um, shouldn't our healthcare providers be actually providing uh, the testing um, at the intervals that are required? And number three, do you think students should be tested? So um, number one, uh, staff are not required to be tested um, routinely. Um, we are recommending that staff be tested on a two monthly basis. Um, in, but if, if, if a staff member refuses, that is not uh, grounds for not allowing them to work. 
we're hoping that people will understand the rationale and the social personal responsibility and, and maybe see it as a matter of social responsibility, which it is to, to, to do that because it does protect um, those around you. And then, um, but if there's a case on campus or if there's a, if there's a cluster or an outbreak, um, people who are, uh, that's a, that shifts to a requirement to be tested in order to be, to be present because uh, the risk is higher. Um, and, uh, and those that refuse to be tested in that setting would be, uh, have to remain outside for, for an interval of quarantine. 14 days. Um, and then, yes, we are um, shifting towards a greater, um, you know, share of responsibility for, for testing across the community um, into um, in diversifying that into our healthcare settings, our, our hospitals, our, our, our care plans, um, our, our doctors and clinics. Everyone is stepping forward and increasing testing capacity. That's been one of the, I think, one of the uh, positive trends over the past month and, 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 and is continuing. Um, and so we are we're, we're reinforcing that with a, with a health officer order that is, a, that is a prompt to our healthcare partners to um, offer testing to their members, their patients um, who are either having symptoms or who, or who are essential workers, including school staff. Um, and so school staff should, be, should expect that their healthcare providers uh, would offer them the testing that we are recommending. Um, and that's, um, that's actually a, a law that has um, has been issued on uh, uh, in late July um, and reinforced again by by CMS. So um, we're, we're the, the testing land case, la landscape has shifted favorably towards um, towards people getting tested uh, through their healthcare providers. Okay, so um, there's more questions. I know we could go on. So I think we'll have number seventeen. Uh, the next opportunity for our community to speak with both of you. I want to end with this comment. Um, from one of our colleagues in the Miller Creek District, Christy Treewater. Thank you for all you're doing to support schools. You are appreciated. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for joining. We appreciate it. Thank you.